Thank you. Good morning and thank you for coming. Um, I'm here to present LightBee, a self-levitating light field display for hologrammatic telepresence. Um, this, th this was thesis work by uh, Zhu Ying Zhang, uh, who was unfortunately could not be here. She's now working for Broadcom. Uh, we'd also like to acknowledge the work of uh, Sean Braley and Calvin Rubens in this project. I'll be presenting more of the background of this work. One of the issues with VR helmets is that they are heavy, cumbersome, and the field of view is rather small and poor resolution. We also lose the ability um, to see the world and to be seen. The occlusion of the head and eyes make co-present face-to-face -face communication uh, difficult, and we don't capture the facial expressions when teleconferencing. Um, there's a need for 3D displays that live in the, three, in the real physical world. So what's going on here? Well, nonverbal cues are actually richer than you would think and more difficult to convey. Eye contact is crucial to multi-party multi -party conversations, and we want to pr uh, preserve the head orientation, and we need to render multiple perspectives, as well as allow for management of personal space. According to Hall, between 1.2 meters and 3.6 meters is the area known as social space, and this is where LightB operates. We need to move, or we need movement to convey proxemics. Uh, however, robots may represent the head too small, or they may not be fast enough to convey those head movements accurately. So now I'd like to highlight some previous uh, systems who've, uh, which have tried to address some of these issues. Here in early system, we see Eric Palos there with a uh, prop, a series of telepresence robots that include wheel robots and blimps. Um, the form factor of the wheeled robot is something you'll see in various other examples later, um, where there is a screen mounted on a stick uh, and moves around on the wheeled robot. Here are some commercial examples, AVA 500 by Cisco and iRobot, and on the right, Double Two from Double Robotics. And in terms of controlling these systems, uh, this is typically done with touchscreen. However, there are some examples as well where uh, this is me robot uh, with Brazil et al, um, where they could uh, capture some of the richness of the facial expressions and movement and translate that into expressive movements of the robot. Here's an example of tracking the head, uh, position for remote viewing through a drone. And then here we see a corollary with a flying display in bit drones. There are also multi-predictor uh, systems. So MultiView was a third-party, or a multi-party uh, video conferencing system. uses a retroreflective screen with three distinct viewports. However, it did not provide stereo uh, stereoscopy, and uh, nor did it con did have uh, continuous motion parallax. Telehuman was then a system that allowed for the remote person to be represented by a 3D volumetric video. It relied on shutter glasses, and as such, was not multi-user. Then we have Telesar, uh, Telesar 4 actually, is a system and it used retroreflection uh, projected on a robot, but the robot itself uh, didn't move beside the arm. Then we have Pan and Steed. Uh, they presented an experimental setup uh, with a cylindrical retroreflective surface, nine projectors uh, capable of projecting nine distinct viewports. Um, the problem with this was that nine cameras were needed to capture these views. So then Telehuman 2, which was presented at Kai last year, put all of these elements together into a light field, um, a light field display that rendered the full-size human, however, it was not mobile. Has anybody seen my legs? <laughs> they don't appear to be below my waist, where I normally keep them. Holly, what's happened to Rimba's legs? <laughs> here they are, right here! <laughs> Stop them! Come on, laggies, this way, over here. Of course, 592. That's where the hologram simulation suite is. That was a clip from the British uh, sci-fi uh, show Red Dwarf, if you recognized it. The show features a flying hologram technology called Lightbee. So Lightbee is a small hologram projector that projects hologrammatic recreations of the dead and contains the personalities of the deceased crew members. It buzzed around inside the projection like a bee and hence the name of the device, and we named our system after that. So the problem is we cannot project in midair. But if we fly a projection surface, we can project multiple views on that surface. By using lots of projectors spaced apart, we can create many viewports that are retroreflected by a very lightweight fabric that can fly, and thus a flying light field is born. Each eye thus picks up a different image from a different projector, no matter where you stand, and that also means you get stereoscopy and motion parallax for free as you move along the projectors. 
So here's light B. Now, I just want to say it looks awful, but that's because the shutters of the 45 projectors are interacting with the shutter of our camera, and we haven't really been able to synchronize that. You don't see that when you actually experience the system, but it's very difficult to film. Um, so here's the drone. It represents the head of the remote interlocutor as a projected on light field, um, and that means the users can see the head of the person flying around in 3D, and it appears as if it's actually inside the drone. Again, that's not something I can show here in 2D video. So here we see a user interacting with the remote participant, um, and uh, the social proxemics are actually quite natural. Um, not only does it con uh, conserve eye contact, uh, but it, it modulates intimacy by moving forward and backwards, just like you do in a regular conversation. Users can step forward, see head orientation, or make eye contact. And if you have multiple users, they will see natural eye contact and head orientation towards their location, and all that is preserved. So the system is multi-user by nature. All right, implementation. So um, the drone is a, a cylindrical retroreflective surface which is mounted. Uh, on a 30 cent, uh, 38 centimeter uh, diameter frame. Uh, the drone has four brushless motors, uh, a micro multi Wii flight controller board, and an ESP8266 Wi Fi board. Um, and uh, the controller is a customized version of multi Wii software that's modified to work with the brushless motors uh, and with our customs communications protocol because we need very, very low latencies, like in the order of 10 milliseconds round trip kind of time. Power is provided by a 1300 uh, milli um, amp hour uh, battery that sustains approximately four minutes of flight because this thing is actually quite heavy. Uh, and then a unique pattern of Vicon markers, you see those, uh, those little dots there. Uh, they uh, allow us to track the drone in real time. Again, that goes very, very fast, very low latency. Uh, and all that is optimized to be able to control the drone precisely within the space of the projection system. One real issue with this is that the uh, cylinder provides a lot of drag. And so you don't want this kind of messy uh, air pressure pattern underneath a drone because you really want to have a jet coming out. And uh, for that reason, we use special props that are not as efficient, but they are angled. And so they push air down faster. Uh, it means the drone flies a little bit uh, shorter, but uh, it, it, it does mean it flies. <laughs> the retroflector fabric is very lightweight. It allows the drone to uh, reflect a projection from a particular angle precisely into 1.3 degrees. So that was engineered as such. Uh, one part of that that's critical is the vertical diffuser. It helps diffuse the light vertically, uh, but it limits uh, the light being uh, horizontally. And we use an RPC photonics uh, diffuser uh, with a 56 degrees uh, vertical scattering angle. And that allows the drone to move up and down without a loss in brightness. Um, it also allows the projector ray to be mounted above the heads of the user. So then as they move along, the brightness of the projection changes 50% by degree by degree, and so that's how you create the light field. A smart projector array is mounted on a rail, uh, 45 Pico Pro 72P smart projectors with each uh, an Odroid system that renders its perspective. So this is a massively parallel computer with 45 uh, viewport renders that render in real time. Uh, 45 images, uh, each one-tenth of a second. Um, since all the light from the projector is retroflected in a narrow, era, uh, in a narrow um, area, that means the Pico projectors are actually quite bright, uh, even in broad daylight. The surround video of the remote person is produced using three stereoscopic cameras, one per 20 degrees. Uh, if you want to do full 360, you need nine. And um, that constructs a 3D volumetric video of the head, um, each Z camera is connected to a high-end uh, GTX uh, 1080 graphics card, which then computes uh, depth images and uh, texture maps. These are then sent over UDP, um, and then software on the Odroids uh, receive that uh, to calculate their own offset uh, for the projector. So these are the six images that you would have to send over Skype. Um, and uh, then uh, projector clusters of 15 projectors will go in there and calculate the plus seven or minus eight, depending on where their location is in the array, uh, using a relief mapping uh, algorithm. Here's how the algorithm works. Each pixel in the image represents a light ray coming from the back of the screen towards the 3D objects in the scene. And so it's bounded by the depth map, uh, which we see here uh, as on the top A and at the bottom B. Um, so we then try to intersect 
uh, the depth map with uh, that, uh, that light ray. And so we see that there's an intersection here at number uh, three, which is incorrect, because really what we want is the top intersection. So we do some searching in this, uh, in this depth map until we find uh, C, which is the correct answer here. And then we look up the color in the texture map, and that becomes the, t the color for that, uh, for that pixel. Markers on top of the light be drawn allow its location to be tracked with eight Vicon motion cameras. Um, the waypoints are set by, uh, for remote head movements by a Kinect. So the Kinect measures the head movements as the person is talking. PID loops then control and adjust the quadcopter's thrust along the X, Y, Z axis. And then two cameras on the drone allow for the remote person to also see the scene on two displays. That means the system is only one way at present, but that's not a fundamental issue. It's just an issue of money. Uh, we did a very limited uh, user study, uh, mainly because we didn't want to kill our participants with this drone. Uh, so six dapper, dapper participants took part in the study and were asked to move around the gray area in the image here. And uh, we asked them to engage in a triadic conversation for about three minutes with an actor who was represented on the drone. And in each conversation, um, this actor made sure that whenever he was talking to the right participant, he'd be looking at them and the left participant looking at them, so making it sort of clear. Uh, what his intentions were with head orientations. And then after each session, the participants were asked to reflect upon their experience. Uh, initial impressions were positive. Most participants noted that the movements of the light beat helped them facilitate turn taking better. Um, P4 claimed that the movement of the light beat gave me a better idea of what the remote person was doing. And P6 claimed that the light beat's movement was easy to understand and smooth. In terms of proxemics, P1 claimed that um, he felt a kind of pressure when it approached me, and that's exactly the kind of thing that you'd want. There's very few video conferencing systems that are capable of giving you that eerie feeling that something's going to happen when a person gets closer. Um, <laughs> the drone definitely helps with that. Uh, P6 also noted eye contact was really helpful, like in a class or a meeting. And P2 noted that it was convenient to show the person around by moving herself, and that it was cool to look around the person by moving around the light beam. Um, surprisingly, only two participants complained about the noise. The system currently is rather noisy for an application like this. All right, so some limitations. Well, currently the system only runs at 10 frames per second. That's mostly due to the Odroids. They're just not fast enough. The system on chips, they, as they get faster, that'll improve. It's not a huge problem. Um, ghosting is visible. That's due to imperfect retroreflection. Um, when you have multiple projectors retroreflecting on a surface, you might see the other projectors slightly. Uh, that can be solved by using a, a, a limited form of face tracking that turns off the projectors where there's no face. Uh, Bidirectionality, of course, so we'd love to have a system that's fully reciprocal, and that could be done by placing Z cameras around uh, the pod. And of course, I already mentioned the noisy propellers. Uh, we've been looking into things like ultrasonic uh, designs that speed up the propeller. Uh, so much that the noise is actually no longer uh, audible. Uh, and of course, there's also anti-sound uh, solutions. Or we could just change the whole design to use, uh, for example, gas propellants or something like that. So, But that's something to look into uh, for the future, for sure. All right, so concluding, um, we presented Lightbee, a drone-based hologrammatic video conferencing system uh, that uses a retroreflective multi-view projection system to create a high-resolution light field transmission of 720p. It supports multiple participants without any need for glasses or headsets, and it allows for moving proxemics as well as 3D facial expressions to be transmitted fully. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I already see a hand up. I'm Claude Bienis from IBM Research. First, I mean, congratulations. An incredible amount of work there. <laughs> I can see I've done much less than that, and I know. But one thing I was thinking is what uh, the drone gives you that, I mean, given your installation, you could be using a, a tethered arm from above or four wires, this kind of installation. What, what, what do you get uh, and get more time, more, more yeah, flight time? Very good question. Uh, yes, we could uh, suspend this on a wire. Um, I think one of the reasons it's a drone is because we've done a lot of drones work. This comes out of bit drones, and so we have the controls, so we had all that. Uh, but uh, I think also there's, there's a lot of benefits to having drones. First of all, 
the face appears inside the drone, so the drone disappears because it's just a retroflector. So the whole thing disappears. And with a wire, you don't really get that sense. So the moment you introduce an artifact that's not real, people just know that this is not real and it just pops the whole telepresence thing. Um, drones are also very responsive in a way that uh, a tethered system would be difficult to build. So there's a bunch of reasons. And finally, if you fly out of the room, you can actually go and inspect your building site, for example. So you can have a communication with someone and then go off and fly off around and, and talk about what you what, or, or but not the projection. What you're, what you're, huh? But not the projection. But the projection would not be visible then. No. Yeah. Hello, Adas from Media Innovation Lab in Israel. Um, so first, very, very cool. Thank you. <laughs> um, I was wondering if your participants gave more general impressions, whether they liked it or not. Did they compare it to regular video conversation, just about the experience in general and not the details of the movement and understanding? Yeah, I'm not going to make any grandiose claims because literally we just had, you know, people rushed in there and rushed out. Um, but it did seem that they were definitely getting what this thing was doing. And I think one of the really interesting elements that I would love to, to investigate further is that the, the, you know, I've always said telepresence will, will never be a thing until there's the threat of killing someone, right? And, and Proximix is actually based on arm length, right? Two arms length is the, is the maximum distance. One arm length is the, is the, is the minimum dis distance. So this drone seems to be amplifying. Not only does it convey it, but it amplifies it because it is slightly dangerous and people are aware of that. So I thought that was really cool. It would be very nice to see what you could do with that design and see if you could dial up the, the social presence, you know. But, uh, yeah, so people did like it. They did think it was kind of like a natural system. Thank you. Uh, my name is Yutaka from University of Sussex. I have a question about the material for the retro uh, detector. <coughs> So I thought the, the problem was the most amazing because of you may be using the, the micro beads based retroreflector, but there's also the corner cube based uh, retroreflector. Usually it's much sharper, it's right. much more precise retroreflection. Have you ever tried that or have you ever considered to use that kind of material? And also, there's also uh, spray based uh, retroreflector. Yeah. So maybe you don't have to stick to this specific uh, material. You can design the, any shape or like you just like spray coating. I just wonder this kind of the design space of the material. <laughs> yeah, that's another thing that's a, it's a wonderful question. Thank you for the suggestions. I, I think that's just something like, I mean, there was a lot of work involved in getting the system to work to begin with. So, you know, we, we didn't look at sort of optimal materials. I th I, we really did like the fabric because it was so lightweight and it worked really well with the drone. Um, I will also say that the, the, there has to be that combination with the, with the diffuser, not just for diffusing vertically, but the diffuser also controls the angle very much more precisely than the microbeads would. So there's a huge design space there for trying to optimize retroreflection so you don't get the ghosting and, you know, so I agree with you. It, you know, maybe we can talk after. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions from the floor? Just a quick reminder that if you are sticking around for a few talks, please move towards the center so that anyone else sneaking in late can grab a seat. Uh, we do have time for one more question, uh, which I do have. Um, I was interested to notice that you've got a pattern for what is the appropriate distance, but does that take into consideration that there can be cultural differences between what oh, yeah. is appropriate? Yeah, absolutely, and, and uh, you know that's a good question. I think that you really do need the reciprocal system, like so both sides, in order to be able to convey that. So my intent has always been that if you just mimic the cues that are, or, or convey the cues that are coming in the natural world, people will figure it out. So we don't have to control for that. But in our system, because it's only, because it's asymmetrical, you would still have issues because, you know, on the, um, on the IMAX, the, the faces aren't exactly correct and the, the, the social park dynamics don't work. So uh, anyways, I, I, I think it's a very interesting area of research, uh, just, you know, even just investigating whether that does or does not work. Uh, but I think it does. Thank you. Thank right. you. Round of applause.